Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the time has already come, so uh, we'd like to start our uh, China uh, session. Uh, at first, uh, uh, let me uh, introdu introduce the, our uh, moderator and panelists. Uh, this uh, session is uh, moderated by uh, Professor Takahara. Uh, he's uh, the professor of the University of Tokyo. And the panelists uh, from uh, uh, left hand, uh, uh, Dr. Ase Ito, uh, associate professor of the University of Tokyo. And uh, uh, Dr. Valerie uh, Nike, uh, she's a uh, uh, senior research fellow JIA and, uh, and uh, head of Asia Department of FRS. And uh, Dr. Shenden Lee, uh, he's a professor of the Fudan University. So, uh, Takara Sensei, uh, please. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming this afternoon uh, to this wonderful panel that we have on China. Um, I'm not going to introduce each of the panelists in detail. There's a profile in the brochure that you have got. Uh, so, let me just dive into the discussions because there's not much time. Uh, it's only up to 2.30, and uh, I'm sorry to say this, but I really have to dash out at 2.30 for another meeting. <laughs> so um, let me uh, pose first uh, some questions to uh, Dr. Ito. I want you to answer these four questions. One is, what are the bright side and the somber side of the Chinese economy? Now, that's the first question. The second question is, what is your evaluation of the Belt and Road Initiative as of today? And the third question is, how do you assess the battle for hegemony of technology that's going on between the United States and China? And fourthly, how do you see the impact of the disturbance in Hong Kong on the economies of Hong Kong and China? And you have to answer all these in 10 minutes. <laughs> Please start. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm um, Aseito. Thank you for a uh, kind introduction. And, uh, in fact, I really enjoyed the session yesterday. Uh, even one of them were quite entertaining, I would say. Uh, so I try my best to answer so some of the questions. So uh, regarding the growth prospect of Chinese economy today, uh, I think one of the consensus is the uh, optimistic in the uh, short run, but the quite pessimistic in the long run prospect. I, I think this is kind of a uh, tentative uh, consensus among the economists. So, uh, I have several friends over, but in China, also in Tokyo, then uh, quite frequently discussing the the, uh, today's Chinese economy. So, uh, so there are many of the positive sides of the China's economy. So today, uh, compared to the 10 years ago, China's uh, consumption is much, much larger. And the, today, China's economy is no longer uh, derived by the investment. So that's one fundamental structure change compared to the 10 years ago. So the other thing is China's digitalization, digital economy, have been developed over the uh, decade or more. Uh, more precisely speaking, Alibaba or Tencent, these kind of platform economy, China led, uh, China uh, successfully incubated the platform companies, uh, which deliver the uh, cashless or also uh, so-called digital ecosystem. So I would say this is quite interesting. And also domestically, China's uh, innovation ecosystem uh, already uh, some, somehow uh, developed from the basic research. In fact, basic research is still uh, under developing, but the, uh, when it comes to the uh, startups, uh, venture capital, so accelerators, or these kind of uh, functions uh, already uh, built inside China. Of course, China is still depending out, outside the resource, but uh, largely the, uh, China successfully uh, developed own the domestic ecosystem. That would be the one uh, positive, I think, uh, contribution to China's prospect in terms of economics. 
So also the policy side, so currently China uh, conduct the kind of uh, active and active uh, fiscal policy and the moderate monetary policy. That, that's an official statement. Uh, in fact, compared to the, uh, when China faced the financial crisis 2008, there was a massive uh, countermeasure to the crisis. Then uh, we argue that it was the overreaction. Uh, they spent too much money on the uh, efficient efficiency on the capital investment decline a lot. So that's uh, today China's uh, uh, government policy has a still uh, enough room to encounter somehow the downturn. So of course there are so many negative sides. So there is a tariff issue, of course. Uh, the local debt issue, and also uh, more fundamentally, the aging society in China. So in China already the so-called labor force uh, uh, started to decline in 2000, uh, since 2012. So uh, I think the middle income trap is still the quite serious problem that China today faces. So, and also, uh, the, there is a possibility to reach in a small deal, uh, maybe possibly this month, but the, uh, it is quite important to reach somehow the, uh, I think, deal. Uh, the reason why is the, that the, some of the uh, foreign investing, invested companies, also even the domestic companies today, are uh, seriously considering whether or not they expand the dom Chinese uh, capacity or just relocate to other uh, countries. So that this uh, I know the uh, December also uh, next several months are quite uh, important, uh, which uh, in give an impact on the decision making on the uh, investment. So uh, that's a brief overview on the economic side. Then. Uh, I would touch upon some of the uh, implications from the uh, current uh, U.S.-China confrontation and also more broadly the uh, trade war. Um, I think one of the biggest risks for Chinese economy facing such confrontation is that the China is still at the, on average, is the middle income level, like 9,000 U.S. dollars uh, per capita, for example. But the, if the China uh, cannot the import some of the uh, advanced technology or capital from outside, that, that means that the China will lose the uh, uh, advantage of backwardness at the given level of income. So uh, I think the, that's gonna be the, from the uh, economic perspective very much critical thing that the, this is related to Hong Kong. So looking at the uh, FDI data, uh, 2018, last year, 70% uh, of uh, for FDI, foreign direct investment into China, goes through the Hong Kong. So that is, of course, a well-known uh, financial function, but the finance is also related to technology for example, Japanese multinational companies or other uh, players uh, have a, a, a branch in Hong Kong and decided the uh, capital investment in mainland China. That is related to the new facility or the new technology, new know-how, new management way, whatever. So uh, I think uh, Hong Kong issue in terms of economics affair, uh, that's closely related to the uh, openness and also uh, closely related to the China's uh, advantage of backwardness. Uh, that, that's uh, my, my uh, view. So it's already eight minutes, so two minutes remain. Uh, what would you say? Yesterday, in, among the keynote speeches, the Ms. De Hilang, uh, her talk was quite impressive for me she touched upon a um, story about the uh, Hillary Clinton's speech at Ohio. Uh, when she, the uh, Hillary Clinton, 
uh, mention about the liberal democratic order, then one of the audience uh, responds that I don't like any of those three words. That's quite, uh, I think, uh, important, the domestic diversity in opinion. Then coming to the Japan's role today, uh, yesterday the minister, uh, foreign minister Motegi uh, proposed kind of uh, uh, bridge making or some moderate position uh, to uh, dealing with the US-China uh, issues. In fact, in September, Nikkei newspaper, uh, I partially uh, collaborated with the Nikkei and conducted some questionnaire to the Japanese businessman, then asking what's the position Japan should uh, about the US-China relation. There's 17.5 percent said China, uh, Japan should facilitate the uh, discussion or dialogue between US and China, 17.5. Then biggest 41 uh, percent respond that Japan has not enough cap capacity to bridge making. That's uh, quite, I would say, uh, Mm, uh, real, realistic response, in fact. So, uh, but still, we, uh, for example, the professor Fukunari Kimura in Keio University, uh, he is the uh, specialist on the trade issues. Uh, he uh, proposed a kind of uh, middle power coalition uh, through the uh, TPP 11 or other multilateral frameworks. So, uh, which are largely based on the uh, rule-based uh, mindset. So I, I also uh, agree to that kind of position that the, we can somehow contribute to the uh, modest and also the uh, middle ground. But the final is uh, there is a great power competition. What if, what, what if something has been decided in White House or not sure in Zhongnanhai in Beijing, whatever, that everything can happen. Uh, that's uh, my uh, tentative re reactions. In fact, I didn't ask that to the BRI or whatever. So we, we can uh, discuss if the times are low. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. It's so challenging to answer all the questions, uh, so that was fine. Um, then I'd like to turn to Dr. Nikkei. Um, I also have four questions to you. The first one is how do you assess the stability of the Xi Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping administration? And the second question, how do you evaluate the impact of the disturbance in Hong Kong on Chinese politics? That's the second. And third, uh, what's your evaluation about the current state of Japan-China relations? And the last question is, uh, recently, how does Europe see China? 10 minutes, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Takara-sensei, and uh, thank you to the GIA for asking me to speak on that session. I really feel part of the team now. And, uh, and I also would like to note, um, with appreciation, the large woman participation in the audience in these roundtables. It means that uh, China brings the best out of all of us, including in terms of uh, gender balance, so it's a good thing. <laughs> we are almost 15 in that room. It's, uh, it's good. Uh, sorry, it, nothing to do with, uh, with China. Anyway, uh, as for the stability of the Xi Jinping administration, as you know, uh, it's, it's a subject of a lot of debate outside of China, and everybody is guessing also inside of China. I am sure Professor Shen, who is an insider much more than I am, will have a lot of things to say about that. Uh, what we hear, uh, and we are not sure it's true or not, is that uh, quite a, a few or one might even say a lot of people disagree with uh, the strategy, 
actual strategy in China of asserting itself on going away from the more modest and prudent strategy of the past. And uh, quite a few people do think that it's not the good way to gain support for China in the long run. I'm not saying that you have a, a divide between Democrats and authoritarians. I think they all more or less have the same objective of maintaining the power of the China, Chinese Communist Party, but this is a choice of uh, tactic or strategy. And actually, the fact that China, and we will go back to that with uh, Japan and maybe even more the EU, uh, China is uh, rising a lot of backlashes, including in Belt and Road, uh, if we could mention that later, and um, reactions to its offensive from the uh, South China Sea to, but other places too, uh, without mentioning, of course, uh, the trade war between the US and China. Uh, all this is not very uh, positive for the future of China that is also facing, uh, as we just heard, a lot of difficulties, both at the social level, economic level, most importantly. And this is important because this is a basis of social stability and support for the party. So this is, this is what I will say for the first question. And uh, once again, I'm really waiting for Professor Shen, if he wants to add something to that. And uh, as uh, related to that, of course, the impact of Hong Kong disturbances on, um, on Chinese politics, um, it's also difficult to evaluate. China is not a transparent society. Chinese people do not have access, free access to the internet and information outside of mainland China, especially where normal people are concerned. Of course, I'm not speaking of experts or specialist analysts. Uh, maybe in Guangdong, near, near Hong Kong, people are more aware of what is going on, but out this apart, basically people think that uh, what the Chinese government is telling them that, uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, the, what is going on is Hong Kong is people who want independence supported by the black hands of the US and other powers and that uh, uh, it can make them uh, rather upset because it attacks directly uh, one of the uh, most important thing for China, at least in the official discourse, which, which is the unity of the country. So uh, I, it's difficult to see how what is going on in Hong Kong can have any effect, in, uh, either in terms of example, as an example to act, uh, or a counter effect as uh, more support for the, uh, the leadership. Uh, but most certainly, one of the most important effects that Hong Kong has on Chinese politics is the consequences of these uh, demonstrations or what is going on in Hong Kong on the Taiwan uh, two side, I mean, Taiwan uh, PRC uh, relation. Uh, there will be elections in Taiwan soon in January, and uh, when you, I, I was in Taiwan recently, and when we, we talked with the uh, independent uh, movement, they were all very happy about what is, what, was, what is going on in Hong Kong just before it gave some support, further support to uh, President Tsai, and uh, she saw a rate growing up a little bit. She had been going down a little bit before, so I... It, what is going on in Hong Kong is definitely not good for the future of one country, two systems, kind of uh, reunification or rapprochement uh, between Taiwan and the PRC. So this is one more example where Xi Jinping's tight tactic and uh, on the Hong Kong government's tactic of being tough uh, did not lead to any good result in terms of image for, uh, for China. And this also goes, of course, with uh, relations with the EU. And it's a global movement where you see that the image of China has been degrading in recent years, on the more and more so. Uh, both the assertive policy of China uh, in the South China Sea is China Sea, uh, the refusal to accept unclose on the rule of law, um, uh, of course, what is going on in terms of human rights in Xinjiang, uh, what is going on also, the policy adopted to, to, to control what is going on in Hong Kong, all this led to a, a, an increasing uh, negative image of China, including uh, in the European Union, 
plus you add to that uh, a slower growth rest, rate, rate, sorry, uh, economic difficulties, which makes China less attractive, even for big companies in Europe. All this uh, combined uh, leads to a, a, a more uh, tougher stance from the EU regarding its uh, China policy. Um, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen uh, uh, recently said that she would pay an equal attention to what can be uh, cause for rapprochement uh, uh, with China, but also to what is what are fundamental differences between the EU, especially in value terms, and uh, China. So this is a stricter position than before. And uh, on a more, more concrete uh, side, the uh, EU uh, has adopted uh, some measures to uh, control more strictly uh, Chinese investments, uh, but um, also uh, made some remarks about Hong Kong. So the EU policy regarding China is definitely tougher than it used to be, and it will be more difficult for China to try to divide the EU, the US, even though we have differences, of course, with the US, especially on trade. And this does not make things easier for President Xi Jinping. And just to finish very quickly, because I'm not Japanese and uh, I don't want to <laughs> intrude into things that are... But um, yes, Japan has been trying to manage, uh, to try to... to to have better relations uh, with China recently. And of course, uh, China is very much uh, interested in improving its own relations with Japan as in a traditional triangle game, uh, as the relations between Japan, uh, China and the US are not so good, they would like to, to get some help and support from Japan. Uh, Japan did not give anything really concrete to China in order to achieve a rapprochement, except that uh, Xi Jinping was has offered uh, a state visit to Japan next year, and apparently he accepted. So we will see what comes out of it. Uh, one thing, uh, when you we see look at that from the European side, is that uh, Japan is an important player, of course, in that Indo-Pacific framework. This is, is at the is it is at the center of that framework, and um, Europe is very much interested in developing its relation with Japan. So for us, it's extremely important to see Japan interested, not only as it used to be the case with big power relationship like the US, of course, which is normal, but also China, but also to go on as it did uh, until a few months ago. Uh, also focus on other important partnerships with Southeast Asia, of course, India, we talked about that, but also uh, Europe. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me now turn to Professor Shen. I also have a few questions to you. The first one is, how do you see the root cause of US-China confrontation and its manageability? Uh, can we manage the relationship? And secondly, uh, DPRK nuclear development, from the Chinese point of view, uh, what is your understanding and view about uh, DPRK nuclear development? And thirdly, What's the impact of the termination of the INF uh, Treaty on the security policy of China and uh, the impact on regional security? And if you could answer um, uh, the question I posed to uh, Dr. Nikkei about the stability of the Xi Jinping administration, we'll all be very pleased. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Takahara. Uh, the first question about the China-US confrontation. I would say it's better to use the word competition. China used to consider that uh, cooperation prevails. Now China may recognize uh, competition is more uh, common, at least in the context of China-US relations. Uh, where we com compete, trade. Uh, President Xi Jinping came to uh, U.S. to meet with uh, Donald Trump on uh, April the 6th, uh, 2017. And he claimed there is 1,000 reasons to uh, improve China-U.S. relations. But it turned to be so difficult to improve. And uh, over two years, 
I think in my personal measure, most of the size of China-US relationship have not been improved. And they are actually deteriorated. I'm not speaking for Chinese government. I can only speaking for, uh, sp speak for myself. Uh, look, trade. China used to export a lot to the US. But from last September, the trade started to decline. And uh, this may not improve anytime soon. That's not good for China, because the trade would promote the job employment, the manufacturing, social stability, government ability to tax and to pay for its government employee, and to build belt and load. Now, with less money uh, taxable, we can do less things. But America wouldn't benefit not from this kind of a trade dispute. U.S. Uh, uh, economic GDP growth has declined from 3.1 uh, in 2017 to 2.9 last year and to, to, to 2.1 first part of this year. And very likely to lower than two for second half of this year. So America would not benefit. But why is it? The question is low cost. Why they do this? They are willing to do the mutual hurting things. I think there are two low costs. One is with China's phenomenal growth, U.S. has a concern. Over 10 years, who would lead the Earth's planet? America has a miss. America is bound to lead. And uh, that is not a scientific. I never trust anyone is bound to lead. You have behaved in a way to convince others we like you to lead. Now America may be concerned that it may be proven not to lead over 10 to 20 years. And many sitting in this room, your government may, may be also concerned if America would not lead, and naturally America is quitting various uh, international treaty and organizations these days, who would lead? Japan leading? I have no problem. A peaceful Japan qualified to lead, and Japan is actually leading uh, CPC, uh, uh, TPP. Japan is leading without American leadership. But what about the Paris Climate Change Accord? Japan lead or China lead? The world need uh, unilateral leadership or uh, 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 multilateral leadership. You need a leader. America used to be a leader. So this is the first question, who would lead? Even though Trump is uninterested in leading, but I think most America uh, cares to sustain American leadership. Second, if China would have the capacity to lead, whether China has secured its leadership through fair means. Americans thought China's uh, magnificent growth has been attained, uh, may not through a fair uh, uh, pr competition. Through state-driven development and not a, a pure market economy. So that's Americans' uh, argument. The question is how to manage it. One management is peaceful decoupling. As the Vice President of the US, Michael Pence, uh, uh, spoke at the Hudson Institute that the China US may decouple. Look, Huawei, uh, M Mate 3030, has not used any US component to build its world class cell phone. The U.S. is forcing Chinese to build our own technology to replace America in one year. Maybe we are already thinking to do this, but America forced us to do it successfully more quickly. Or we secure 
uh, components from Japan, from South Korea, from China's Taiwan, and from Britain. And they don't, they don't care the U.S. sanction. They take a risk to do the business. Now, American chip maker has lost the business. This is 300 billion U.S. dollar market. And we buy, a year ago, 70 billion U.S. dollar equivalent of American chips. And now they may lose. If they impose sanctions not only on Huawei, but on other Chinese uh, electronic pro uh, produ producers. So this is decoupling. It's a management. And we don't hurt America. And we don't care you don't uh, export this to us. China now cares to export our cell phone to the US. At the future time, China may not care. If you want to buy, we don't sell this to you. We only sell this to Japan, our real friend. It's not impossible. So American exporters care to press White House to give them opportunity to waive the sanction so they can still import some stuff to Huawei. But Huawei say, I no longer need. This is a management, but I don't like. I want China to buy the stuff from the US and the rest of the world, even though we can produce. I care our friend sitting in this room to buy Huawei and to buy other Chinese good stuff, even though you can produce your own uh, uh, products. Let's share the world together. I can have two cell phones. Uh, Madame Ong Wan, so when he was under custody by the Canadian authority uh, last uh, uh, December, she carried six cell phones. Five out of six were iPhones. <laughs> so the family who produce Huawei really love iPhones. This is a word I really like. So please don't sanction Huawei this way. Tell Huawei we have opinion. We hope you would listen and you would adjust some of your uh, 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 improper quote unquote uh, uh, practice. And this is what the China US are negotiating. What constitutes the standard of fairness? What is definition from certain international organization or international paper that China has subscribed and US views China has not implemented? Tell us, if you make sense, we would follow, we would make a necessary adjustment. And uh, probably after one and a half year, a very uh, challenging uh, talk, the two countries are approaching to uh, signing the first stage of the trade deal in which China would make a, a substantial adjustment. And the US would wait for future time to negotiate the next stage. So the US would no longer say, uh, a bad deal not to conclude everything is even worse than to have no deal. The current U.S. government, after negotiating with China for one and a half years, has concluded that a partial deal with some progress is better than to have no deal. That's the manageability. Question two, I will be short. DPRK nuclear development uh, from Chinese perspective, from one Chinese perspective. DPRK has a reason for nuclear development. That is security. They don't feel secure. Uh, South Korea used to develop a nuclear weapon. US used to deploy nuclear weapon on the territory of Taiwan, on uh, Japan, and on uh, South Korea, on the land, not only on uh, its submarine. So North Korea has difficulty. On uh, North Korea's sorry, uh, territory, it has no foreign troops. So therefore, they think the security balance in, on the peninsula is not properly balanced. They want the USGI to leave, to withdraw a nuclear weapon that George W. H. Bush did. And they invented a better idea to build their own nuclear weapon. My sympathy is with North Korea, but not on nuclear weapon. That would neither resolve the issue that they have concern, but would complicate this issue and uh, would uh, make uh, nobody to, to feel secure. North Korea would eventually become more insecure. 
So China has pushed North Korea through our partnership with Tokyo, with Moscow, with Washington to beat North Korea, you have to abandon. Say, don't listen, Then more punishment through various IAEA uh, resolution and UN Security Council resolution. Say, still don't listen. What we can do? We partner with America, with Japan, and we have sheer common interest. And North Korea become poorer and poorer. They have no food. They have lots of economic challenges. Then they start to be wise, to talk, to use negotiation in Singapore and in Hanoi and probably soon in another place. That's good to talk. To talk to relieve Americans' concern. And America may make some uh, uh, adjustment of the policy to relieve <laughs> North Korean's security concern. I think they are close to a settlement. North Korea want to have a uh, face the program, like China, US would, may have faced the program. Not one program to settle all dispute, that's not possible to use a pragmatic approach. First approach, they have suspended their nuclear weapon test and the long range <laughs> missile test. They think they have not been awarded. U.S. says you have to abandon everything before uh, receiving award. In my personal humble view, that's totally not uh, 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 realistic. Once you have acquired nuclear weapon, abandon <coughs> all, and your partner may not honor their word. So North Korea want to get some nice things to lift some of the UN Security Council resolution on humanitarian uh, aid. They want to. Uh, uh, receive what they want. So I support them. No matter my government supports them or not, I support them. They deserve. We should encourage them to take the next step to abandon 30 to 50 percent of their existing nuclear weapon, but not 100 percent. Allow them to have a few years to build a culture to prove U.S. is genuine, U.S. is no longer enemy. And then for the third stage, they abandon all. The entire process may take uh, several, two years or three years. I think we are ever closing to it, even though we have not officially sealed the first deal, as uh, the first stage. Last, the impact of, of INF. INF is to reduce nuclear threat in the uh, European continent. Uh, for medium and intermediate range nuclear force, ranging from 500 to 5,500 kilometers uh, between Warsaw Pact and uh, the European part of the NATO. That's good. At a time when China did not have many INF, they don't care to make it multilateral. I think still they don't need to care because China by this time does not have many nuclear weapons, including uh, medium and intermediate range nuclear force. But uh, we may have more conventional force of that range. That uh, constitute a threat to the US uh, ship. If they ventured to military arm Taiwan and to intervene into a Taiwan contingency. Mainly the capability constitute a threat. But in our view, we appreciate America to help us to revolt Taiwan from Japan uh, in 1945. We still remember and appreciate. But we have difficulty in seeing America to play a role which is active to prevent the two parts across Taiwan Strait to ch achieve their integration. And America has a Taiwan Relation Act, Taiwan Security Reassurance Act, and in our view, this constitutes an uh, unacceptable uh, uh, intervention. China is called China, Zhongguo. It's a middle country. Middle is a position she will not be biased, but also it is a bigger country sitting in the middle of the entire Earth planet. 
We cannot accept our elder brother, America, to stand in front of us, threatening, if you touch Taiwan, I would touch you. China has difficulty. But China had to build its capacity to tell America, it, it cost more to you than to me if you would venture to uh, honor your threat. And the two countries have played the competition from 1979. Even though China-US has so-called modernized, uh, 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 normalized the relationship, actually, they still hedge. And then now, the mainland, one minute, is building, maybe building quite a sizable uh, conventional deterrent, not a nuclear deterrent. That may not suit the scope of the old INF or a future INF. So INF does not apply to China. But uh, for conventional, intermediate range for us, U.S. has concern. So we hope the U.S. would not compete with us, but if the U.S. is willing to compete, China would not lose. These missiles are cheap. And we, we are a big land-based country, and Taiwan is so close to us, and we can formidably deter the U.S. naval force to make it not to have the gut to intervene into a future Taiwan contingency. No matter U.S. whether withdraw INF or not, U.S. has no capability to counter the mainland with conventional uh, intermediate range force. So the two countries should not uh, compete in a negative way. U.S. would violate international law to protect its selfishness in the name of protecting human rights in Taiwan. This is not the right approach. U.S. need to talk to China how the two, the two parts need to respect each other, need to peacefully, harmoniously coexist with each other, eventually to attain a mutually acceptable, uh, peaceful integration. It's up to the wisdom of the uh, Chinese across the street. But don't uh, tell us if we would do something, American would use its military force. That's not the rule-based order. We have heard a lot of liberal international order. I really don't see. Americans... Uh, Bar barbaric behavior would only educate China that uh, if you observe a so-called law-based word, you would be hurt by America. Professor Shen, you'll get a second Sh round, so can you wrap Thank up? you very much. Yeah. All right. Maybe I asked too many questions. <laughs> uh, but you all get a second round. We are going into the second round now. I want you to speak in five minutes about... Um, Three things. One is, I'm going to add another question or two to you, so you please answer those. And secondly, if you want to answer some of the questions that you could not answer because of the lack of time in the first round, you can do that. And thirdly, if you have any comments about the remarks that are made by uh, other panelists, uh, please comment on, on those. Okay, so let's start from um, Professor Ito. <coughs> what do you think are the reforms, the economic reforms, or even political reforms, that China needs most now? And is Xi Jinping ready and able to implement those reforms? If there are um, opposing forces, what are they? That's my question. Uh, would you like to start? So my response would be quite short. Uh, first of all, it's uh, about the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I think it's already six years when it was first uh, issues. Um, in fact, it's begun around 2015, I guess. The, the So almost four years passed. In um, the, as the uh, Nikkei mentioned about, the, there is a backlash. Uh, in fact, the, some of the, the arguments is uh, asking the question about debt trap. Uh, I think, especially after 2018, 
uh, also uh, even earlier in 2017, uh, Chinese government also uh, seriously considering such kind of the debt stability. So uh, there, there, I think there are several transformations uh, in Belt and Road Initiative compared to the initial uh, ideas. Uh, one of the ideas is uh, still uh, have to think about the debt uh, stability of the project and also recent arguments or papers uh, often mention about so-called quality, high quality belt and road. In fact, we, we Japanese use the high quality infrastructure, this kind of the message, but the China start to use the uh, high quality uh, Initiative that that's quite interesting for me. Uh, still, it's in on the paper, but the, we we maybe can focus what's going on in the next ten years. Um, the other thing is the uh, so-called uh, digital belt and road. Uh, I think the some of the satellite development, also the. Uh, uh, fiber cable or infrastructures. Uh, I think these are uh, also the e-commerce uh, network covering the Southeast Asia, for example. Uh, I think that's quite a uh, new keyword uh, worth uh, noting. Uh, anyway, just begun, I think, the just three or five years uh, started since the initiative. So we need to still uh, keep looking what's the reality, what's the uh, also the initiative in the paper, both sides. And the re regarding the reform, uh, there are several discussions about the reform uh, ongoing in the current China. So uh, one of the arguments, I think the Nicholas Radi in I think Peterson Institute of International Economics, they, he published a uh, uh, book, the subtitle is G End of Economic Reform China, Christian. Uh, I think that's uh, published this year, earlier. Um, that's kind of argument. Uh, I think the 10 years ago, when this the end of the uh, Fujintao period, uh, I think several uh, economists are quite uh, optimistic about the privatization. Um, we often use the reform of our opening, you know, Kai Ga Kai Fan, but the today, uh, still in the document, we see the uh, keywords uh, reform and opening, but the reality should, uh, we should keep asking the, what's the reform inside. For example, the, the mix ownership structure change uh, started, I think, already three or four years. Um, one of the argument is that the, such uh, reform uh, forced to the uh, IT companies or private uh, efficient companies to pay, paying the much of fun to support the state sector or some others. So that, that's a kind of possible, uh, I think, the negative evaluation on the reform. So that's uh, one possible. Then more fundamentally, I think the some of the ridiculous arguments are uh, often observed in China. So among them, uh, the most ridiculous, the idea is that the nationalization of BAT by the Alibaba Tencent. Uh, the paper is written by the uh, associate professor in the uh, party uh, university, Dan Xiao in the, some provinces. Of course, the many of the Chinese citizens also criticize such argument, but the potentially that's kind of uh, ridiculous things sometimes goes, comes up. So that, that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, totally the uh, opposite that what, what China has been done 40 years. Um, it's also uh, quite uh, dangerous to uh, manage the uh, future development. Thank you. Thank you. Now let me turn to Dr. Nikkei. Uh, you told us about um, EU unifying in dealing with China. But uh, from a certain perspective, can't we say 
that the Chinese are using the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to undermine EU unity. For example, uh, recently uh, Italy uh, signed an MOU uh, about the BRI, and in Greece there's an increasing number of Chinese people and a lot of Chinese money uh, coming in, and there's a 16 plus initiative from uh, Beijing coming. So how do you see this uh, um, issue about the BRI reaching uh, Europe. And in this context, if you could touch upon uh, the European view of Russia-China relations, I would much appreciate it. That's a lot uh, in five minutes. Uh, so <laughs> I will, I will <coughs> try to, to, to just give, give a, a few words about that. Um, yes, you mentioned Italy signing that MOU on uh, Belt and Road. Um, as you can see, you mentioned also Greece. Uh, China, of course, has, has been targeting uh, the weaker links uh, due to the economic problems that these countries have been facing, especially after the financial and eco economic crisis in 2008. Uh, Portugal has been another target. Uh, but one should not make too much about these I MOU signing. They, the content is very fuzzy. We do not... I mean, it's more a kind of show off than uh, reality, and Italy is Italy after all. And, uh, but I don't think it uh, profoundly undermines the trend I mentioned of EU being more and more consci conscious and aware of China's strategy, or including the dividing strategy. And when I mentioned backlash, of course, that dividing strategy of Europe uh, especially with the 16 plus one uh, initiative that included uh, members and non-members of the EU by China has not been well received uh, in Brussels. And it has been uh, perceived as another uh, testimony of, Japan, uh, of China's uh, strategy of division, of weakening uh, Europe. Uh, of course, Europe for China uh, can be very useful, and China talked a lot, used to talk a lot about multipolarity, including uh, Europe as one of the poles. Uh, but the only Europe that China can accept is a Europe that plays in its favor in the big uh, competition that uh, Professor Shen mentioned between the US and China. And, and it, uh, it is less and less successful in uh, getting, in, in succeeding. Uh, now China is also very active in the UK uh, after Brexit. Um, of course, it's not a division of the EU because uh, the UK does not need uh, China to go away from the EU, but still it's a way to try to find new allies uh, in, in, in Europe. And um, uh, the, uh, including for the Belt and Road Initiative in Eastern, and, um, in Eastern Europe and uh, um, Countries like Poland, who used to be very favorable to China, uh, are much less so now. And this is also because uh, Chinese investments are not coming in such a number as was expected. The quality is also lacking. And uh, so the perception of China's positive role, even in a very pragmatic way, is not that uh, as good as it used to be at the beginning of the launching of that uh, Airbnb, uh, BNR initiative by, uh, by China. About uh, China-Russia, um, there are many different analyses. I think this is also related to the fact that contrary to what some people may say in Europe, I think there is a debate or there are multiple, many uh, positions on China in Russia itself. So depending on who with whom you discuss and meet, uh, of course it's, of, it's in the interest of Russia right now to make big show of that uh, incredible partnership between Russia and China on, on the ideological front and uh, against uh, any kind of US or Western interference. They are on the same uh, page. Uh, but I still, I don't think that Russia and China uh, interest, fundamental interest and long-term interest uh, fundamentally coincide, uh, including in Belt and Road Initiative. There are a lot of declarations, but every year the same uh, declarations about um, building closer links between Russia 
and China on integrating better Russia's interest into the Belt and Road Initiative, and that is not really coming. So basically, uh, I think Europe also has an interest in um, discussing more maybe with Russia in order not to push Russia too much into the arms of China, even if there are limits to this uh, possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, um, Professor Shen, you have enlightened us a lot about um, Chinese perspectives about uh, China-US relations. Uh, so let me focus on China-Japan uh, relations. My uh, single question would be, um, what will be the policies towards Japan that China will be taking from now? You know, we are very happy about the improvement in Japan-China relations, I believe, on both sides. Um, but while Chinese people's image of Japan is improving very rapidly, the Japanese image of China is not. And the biggest reason is because the Chinese government keeps on sending their Coast Guard vessels into the territorial waters around the Senkaku or Diaoyi in Chinese. Um, will the Chinese government be able to stop that? And what are the other policies towards Japan that China will take to improve the relations with uh, Japan? Thank you very much. It's a mutual uh, perception issue. On the Chinese side, uh, I, w when I say we, I mean I. I do not mean Chinese or Chinese government. But I still use the word we. We respect Japan's achievement of peaceful development. Japan has not uh, launched a single bullet uh, externally since 1945. Uh, even though some want to adjust uh, Article 9 of the peace constitution, but it's still there. And Japan has really no policy to restrain itself uh, for certain uh, nuclear development. Uh, Japan's environmental protection, Japan's uh, protecting uh, its own people and uh, uh, social welfare, education, innovation, great. 19 Nobel Science Laureate in 19 years from the year 2000. It's admirable. I wish my country would achieve such great achievements. This may explain, not me, but many other Chinese admiration of Japan. But we have a huge difficulty. Why some Japanese uh, still say there is no such a thing as Nan Nanking magic? Why some J Japanese uh, would keep saying that uh, comfort women uh, out of their own uh, voluntary uh, willingness. For this, we have difficulty. Not only I, but uh, uh, Congressman Lentos had a difficulty. When he was still alive, he was in his public service. He spent his money uh, co-signing a whole page for the New York Times uh, to speak uh, openly, differently from the then Japanese government. And the then Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, said, these are sex slaves. I think uh, Chinese, Chinese may not like uh, uh, Madame Clinton a lot, but we like what he stated this way. But on the side of Japan, since uh, uh, Japan sought the issue of Dari Island or Senkaku in Japan's term has already been settled. Why China would raise it again and again? Even though the two countries may have cut a fishery agreement, why Chinese fishermen would come to this uh, place uh, which is sensitive again and again? And why China, Chinese Coast Guard would uh, enter uh, uh, this uh, sensitive water? So Japan has a question, would you mind not to come? China said, if you keep your behavior speaking erroneously, uh, we would do something. But luckily, through the good 
uh, management between the two countries. First, uh, the frequency of our Coast Guard to enter those uh, disputed water is far less by now. We cannot uh, promise we would never come again, but uh, the reality is that we come far less. So this is the management. And uh, we also take a notice that uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe is not uh, visiting Yasukuni by himself. He sent his wife to, to be there and uh, to give some gift. We may still have some difficulty, but uh, uh, his uh, behavior is far less provocative these days than uh, initial years. So all this uh, mutual understanding and uh, improvement to be less provocative helps. The two military have cut their paper on managing the East China Sea incident at the sea and in the air. That's great. China has its uh, East China Sea uh, air defense uh, uh, zone and Japan has your own zone. These two zones have some overlap. So we need to have some institutional management to avoid dangerous collision. That happened between Chinese and US Air Force uh, in the place close to Hainan Island. We should never let this happen between China and Japan. So Prime Minister Abe came to China and my president may come to uh, this place uh, in the spring next year. We still have a lot to build legally and institutionally to, uh, to make ourselves to abide by some rule, existing rule or build a new rule that our two parties would agree. Over time, if we have new rule that both would agree, not only more Chinese would uh, uh, respect Japan, I think more Japanese would over time more understand and respect China. Something we may never be able to resolve, the sovereignty of Diaoyu and of Senkaku. But we should find a way to let it be eternally, peacefully, peaceful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we have 10 more minutes left for uh, questions and answers. Oh, I may not be able to ac accommodate all the hands that have risen. Uh, please uh, uh, understand. The first uh, gentleman here, uh, the microphone to the gentleman in the front row, please. Thank you. I am Bani Hashemi from the Iran Embassy Scientific Attache. My question is that in the history of science, we learned that democracy and the progress of the science are with each other. But in the case of China, uh, it is contradiction. Can any of the uh, candidate answer? Thank you. Sorry, contradiction between what and what? Democracy and progress of science are with each other. Okay. But in case of China, <laughs> it is contradiction. Ah, okay, I, I understand that. Uh, let's collect some questions. Yes, uh, Negoro-san in, in the front. Please raise your hand again. Yes, gentleman who stand up, who's just stood up. Yeah, thank you very much. My, my name is Hiroshi Meguro, and uh, I'm a freelancer, and I cover Okinawa mainly, and so, uh, I'm quite interested in the uh, situation in East Asia, um, including uh, China's uh, actions uh, in the region. And uh, my question uh, is uh, to uh, Professor Shen. And uh, what is your definition of democracy? It's related to the previous question, but uh, what is your definition of democracy? And a lot of Chinese uh, leaders say that uh, Western democracies and Chinese democracy should be different. Could be different or should be different. And what's the difference? And uh, you are talking about uh, very often stability, but uh, wh how about uh, human rights and the free, including freedom of speech? And, and then probably what is more important, transparency. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. The gentleman behind, yes, who's in the middle row. Yes, thank you. Yes. 
Thank you very much. My name is Shikata, a member of JIIA. Let me ask Professor Shen about the blockchain. Uh, President Xi Jinping emphasized that blockchain will be very important from now on. China once internationalized renminbi, but now it seems to be slowing down. So what are you going to do with blockchain? Are you going to challenge US dollar's dominance by using blockchain? That's the first question. The second question is about state-owned enterprises. So-called SOE are becoming larger and larger by merging other big MOE, uh, SOE. On the other hand, the private companies are not doing very well because of such a larger SOE. Then China has difficulties in overcoming present problems of overcapacity, over debt, overproduction, and so on. So what is your policy to properly handle Chinese economy from now on? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'm afraid because of the limitations of time, I'm sorry I could not accommodate all the questions. Um, and this is a panel on China, so it may be natural that all the questions were directed to the only Chinese uh, on, on the panel. So I'm afraid, uh, Professor Shen, uh, you have to answer all the questions in uh, four minutes, please. <laughs> well, I cannot pretend I know everything. <laughs> Uh, democracy. Democracy. I, I teach often. The next January, I would go to Colorado Springs to teach Colorado College again, China Foreign Policy. They have a slogan, democracy is both the objective and also the tool, the means. Our objective is to let the majority to decide. And most don't indeed let the red guard to decide. They beat Liu Shaoqi, they make China very chaotic. So democracy should not only be let the majority to decide. Sometimes the elite minority could also help. So the, the objective should, I think, should change to improve the people's welfare through a certain means. The means is through peaceful consultation. Then to let the people's uh, uh, representative, so indirect representativeness to decide. So America use partial demo de democracy, not uh, direct democracy, indirect representativeness. And China does the same. And the President Xi would never use Red Guard again to beat uh, uh, Bo Yibo. We let a lawyer to defend Bo Yibo. So this is an improvement. Of course, China may still have a bigger room to lift its, the quality of its demo, uh, democracy. And China may invent some better form of de democracy. Therefore, we, we may say democracy could be different. But I would not say must be different. Uh, must you mean that when we have a different approach, some is apparently good, but uh, I must be different from yours. I would intention to invent someone, something else, and I may fail to invent. So if someone has a good practice, why we cannot learn? And Hong Kong has its democracy, electing its uh, people's delegate at the district level. And we let it happen, it happened. And this may or may not happen exactly in Beijing, in Shanghai. So we call one country, two system. And we respect their system. And we hope they would not impose their system upon us, and we would not impose our system upon them, at least for the moment. But over time, who knows? They would not ask us to, to, to teach them how to do our version. Or we would not ask them to lecture for us how they manage their system. It's a process. Uh, as to the first question, the relationship between democracy and uh, uh, the level of progress of science and technology. I don't see immediate relationship but I see some collateral uh, phenomenon. China's uh, life expectancy has doubled 
from 30 plus 70 years ago to 70 plus now and to 85 in Shanghai, catching up with Japan. I would not say it is due to democracy or it is due to the achievement of science, scientific de development. But the scientific de uh, development apparently improved the Chinese medical science. And we have some money, we spend money on science and we build the, uh, the, the, the service and we make people to, to have a longevity. This is the positive side. And sometimes you may see the negative side, facial recognition. Some would view it may not be po uh, positive. It's very uh, uh, controversial. San Francisco has made a law not to use this uh, for its people. It may be the first city in the world. Not all cities in the US has adopted the San Francisco approach. I would say it's very controversial. We have to spend lots of time to see how AI would uh, uh, direct and how its negative impact on human race, on our human security could be. How it can potentially increase national security but undermine international security. Or increase international security but undermine national security. So it's a way too premature to conclude the relationship between scientific development and, and uh, democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to everybody in this room. Um, I'm afraid time is up, but uh, we are reminded of all the very profound questions that we are facing today. And um, sh surely an hour and 15 minutes is just not enough to uh, uh, dwell into all the questions that were touched upon. But I very much appreciate um, the attendance of all the panelists. You know, history proceeds in zigzag. And this is not a good time for intellectuals. Uh, and you, I think you all un understand that. Uh, so with, uh, please join me in a, a big hand uh, to all the panelists uh, from the three countries. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, part for participating in our session. The next session here on Korean Peninsula will be started at uh, 2.40.